um, in the spirit of Pog and Friends, my friend um, and daughter, um, Olive, who's going to uh, share a poem. We're splitting our time. After I came home after two years, I went into my backyard and saw our anthill. It grew and grew and grew until it was a big anthill. Now there's two ant hills. I like to watch the ants come in and out and out and in. Then I jump into the pool. I feel happy. So I was trying to figure out what I could uh, read to follow that. And uh, I'm working on a collection of uh, po po poems. That's what it's called, poems. Um, but I think that uh, um, they might be more like monologues. And this one is uh, based comes from the voice um, of Marie Curie. But I actually, I tapped into some of my own experience saying goodbye to um, my daughter um, when she was four years old going off to school. It's called Sometimes I Tell My Daughter. Sometimes I tell my daughter, you may feel one thing so strongly, it seems it's the only true thing. But then the feeling splits into two and you find that there are more true things. She holds my hand and does not look up. It's also possible, I tell her, to feel more than one thing, or for one feeling to split into other feelings and break down steadily over time. She begins to cry. There's nothing more I can do. The teachers wave at me from across the hall. I turn, she reaches after. It's best to leave quickly, they tell me. She must learn. After all, there are only a very few hours in every day. They, at least, do not divide endlessly. Life is heaped up, just so much matter. But inside, inside, I imagine everything I've ever touched, everything I've ever thought, everything that's ever brushed up against my heart or mind as little blue lights inside of my body, invisible to the naked eye. On the, on the surface, most days are dull now. The work is steady but fails to progress. The children peck at each other. For the little one, at least, at the schoolyard gate, it does not become easier to say goodbye. You're strong, brave, I tell her, and pry her little hand from mine. Then turn and pretend to be brave. Though most days, frankly, I would prefer, rather than turning to take her back inside my body, would prefer never leaving, never learning, never having to learn. But it makes no sense. You can't go backward like that, so I don't. I push her out instead. Steadily, I expel her. It is painful, but at least the pain is pure. At least there is nothing beneath it, nothing otherwise. At least it glows. Thank you. Next is Boyer Rickle. If anybody else wants to bring Olive up or somebody else, <laughs> uh, that's okay. Just let us know. Delighted to be a part of this event. Um, Pog is a cherished tradition here in Tucson. I'm going to read two brief passages from a memoir titled Morgan Alaric that was published this spring by Goldline Press. It's about um, the life Morgan Lucas, Morgan Lucas Schultz, poet here in Tucson that many, some of you knew, uh, I see some heads nodding, the life that we lived together uh, toward the end of his life. Uh, it's in four parts, and I'm going to read two brief passages from the second part. In the second reading, there is a long sentence about the nature of love from a novel by Robert Musil, and it gets interrupted by um, details from the hospital room where the 
passage is located. Okay. Post-coital, heads on pillows, waves breaking into foam. The ceiling fan's rhythmic clicking reminds me of the projector in the darkened sixth grade classroom. <clears throat> The lights beam throwing Hemo the Magnificent on the screen, an animated film of blood's wonders and the circulatory system. Student of the body's late middle age, Morgan notes the hairs inside my ear. An entry, I think, into an imaginary, unlikely future text, his own aging body. The huffing rise and fall of the sheet across his chest. Was there a time before reflection when humans thought the voices inside their heads were gods? He probes the neck folds, runs his thumb across a black mole, the shape and size of an eraser head. Could this be cancer, he asks. The sun's dry mouth against the window glass. No, that then to compare to this now, I think. Is having a body a threat to the mind? Listen, he says, guiding my head to his chest. Can you hear the crackles? Like sparks in the imagined dark of his lungs. What we see in the mind, the mind's eye, is temporary. Built one detail at a time. The crackles like sparks, the sparks like stars, the lungs two dark pools. An image quickly fades unless we summon the details again. Know that then to compare to this now, I think. We took turns collecting the green and red paper tickets stamped Ban Bras at the Baja toll booths on the road from Tijuana. Bookmarks, Cully taught us, that would return us anywhere we might be in our daily reading to the beach. Why did you let yourself get caught? St. Francis asked the animal captured in a trap. For in love, everything is love, a novelist writes. Saline vials, the red pen we use for crosswords, the beeping vitals meter. Even pain and revulsion, patients tethered to ivy poles smoke in the outdoor area, a floor below, become experience embedded in one's nature, barely expressible in words. In the hospital file, I'm the older gentleman and family friend who visits daily. Five slices of bacon, two muffins, a stack of pancakes, a strawberry fruit smoothie, a bowl of cereal with milk, three orange juice cartons, a banana, and a carafe of coffee. The text photo Morgan sends, his breakfast order, the morning after a cystic fibrosis doctor tells him he has a 50% chance of living five years without a lung transplant. Why did you let yourself get caught? As I place his latte on the bedside stand, he runs his hand over my hair. Oh, the landing strip, always the same. That'll cost you, I say, inhaling as I lean to kiss him on the neck. Gross, you were a dog in another life. <laughs> Don't give the notes, Casal says. Give the meaning of the notes. The art of memoir, I think. The anti of belatedness. Thank you. When my daughter talks about wanting a sister like she did last March, walking around New York in the rain after the shark exhibit, she says, we'd need two of everything. Sometimes these conversations about another version of our best life, for me, the one that didn't happen, my heart's in my throat, both of us longing for different reasons. D lists those things we need two of. The bunk beds we got rid of that would have to go back in her room, for example. On this day, the sister is also 10, but may or may not have glasses, dyslexia, love animals, or no ASL. Dee thinks it might be good for them to have different strengths so they could work as a team, having double powers together that they wouldn't on their own. I keep asking questions to run this desire line of hers to its full extent until she seems satisfied. It gets pretty elaborate. 
I think fleshing it out as a thought experiment gives it a weight that can be let go. We'd need another umbrella, rain boots, not purple, another metro card, airplane ticket home, a booster seat, unless sister happened to be bigger than she. I offer half wondering, half hoping, if in this moment she also finds us a completely awesome family threesome or ninesome, if you include the animals. It's a leading question, I know, but trying not to yield my own longing, something turns over inside anyway. My heart presses on my voice again, and tears come. What I don't say is that conceptual sister of hers has a name and is three years older than she, a story of loss that logistical language can't touch even now. My mind imagines our currently tiny house with four girls, women in it, and how we'd be up in each other's business more than we already are with one bathroom, and I think that just wouldn't do. Yesterday, Facebook reminded me that I was bereft. 13 years ago to the day, like a point on a map, destiny located. The baby named Simone left after being with us since birth. I don't mean passed away, but more like when a thing not considered risky becomes risk, a fail-safe system failing, as in adopting is a house of cards, as in G-O-N-E gone with a big gaping hole of a no right in the middle. Sister wasn't dead, she was in the Bronx. We had to put her on a plane in the arms of a family member to take her to her for a real future. She wasn't, our, she wasn't ours for more than that, though what we'd signed up for was, you know, forever. My body can't lie, so when I'm reminded of this great love, twinned with the great losing that just is, it's hard to speak. Sometimes it comes in white hot fury as a mother of two with one. When something extremely avoidable hurts my kid or my family, like loss, ghosting my machine. I don't know, maybe living the best life means there are the tragedies you cannot outrun and then just stay with you instead of the life, the thing, or the person themselves. And still, there's a tiny rose-colored blanket a friend knitted for our firstborn. It's a favorite of Dee's, a hand-me-down from her big sister in a way, from the cosmos. My name is Naomi. A little bit about myself, I do host uh, poetry first Friday of every month at Revolutionary Grounds. If you want to come and check it out, I would love to see you guys there. So I've been in a kind of creative rut lately. So I've been forcing myself to write and I've been having these trigger words, right? Each day I kind of write and I center myself to what does this word mean? Why is it affecting me? So I'm going to share two of them for you. Um, also, I'm very spiritual, so dive in with me, because we're going to get deep, <laughs> if I can find it. All right, we're going to go ahead and start with survive. <clears throat> My whole life, I have been on survival mode, waiting for the next moment I will need to sink or swim. Waiting for someone to yell at me, take advantage, be cruel. And I will take it, always afraid of myself, if I allowed my darkness to come through. I knew it wouldn't, I knew I couldn't cause more harm. I became a statue. If I don't move, don't breathe, don't speak, I would be left alone on my island, no one to abuse me except myself. My past has prayed for a day where I could just live, 
where my mind knew peace, my heart knew love, and my soul could rest. A day where I no longer played in a role as a victim or an abuser, I've always been so hard on myself, believing I was not worthy of those days of bliss that I would only know tragedy. I would be in a constant fight of life and death. While, what was I even surviving for? Funny how I can forgive everyone in my life except myself for staying alive. A part of me prayed to die, to not be on this earth anymore. I didn't want to live past 20, but I still fought, and I feel like I cheated myself, as if the only thing I, des if I, if the only thing I deserved was death. Maybe I just wanted the easy way out, because to survive you need strength when I considered myself weak. You need compassion when I hated my reflection. You need forgiveness when I resented breathing. I still think about my death, how easy it is to take my own life, curiosity of what's beyond my human pain. I would plead with God for my end. I only wanted to not feel everything I felt. I wanted to know if I died that I could start again, that I could be given a life where I didn't have to be raped. I didn't have to be molested, yelled at, hit, made to feel the abuse of love. Where I didn't have to see the shadows who loved to kill me and others, or the voices that screamed and cheered for me to commit suicide. I wanted to die and face God and ask why. To see if he cries, to see if he cared. Religious trauma of going to hell, was my life not enough of one? What of the people who killed my innocence? Are they worthy of forgiveness, of heaven, but not me? Why did I survive? What is the point of living? What is the point of what I went through? I hate the reality that I did all of this out of choice. And I can't seem to forgive myself. Right, right, right. Thank you, thank you. My next one's a little not as deep, I promise. <laughs> but it'll still hit home, especially for people that don't know how to meditate. I got you because I'm one of those people. <laughs> Sorry, I like to jump around and like move it and like it's upside down. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the time. All right. I find meditation difficult to silence my body, my mind, to be at the core of my soul, to not attach myself to the random thoughts, the noises, to be fearless when my third eye opens, the messages that start pouring in and I become overwhelmed with the connectedness I'm feeling. The rush of who I am comes flooding and the self-doubt gets me to move my position. When I close my eyes and take those breaths, I become grounded, yes, I become something new each time and the new right now feels too much. I hardly recognize myself, and each time I return from the spirit world, I am reminded how much I still have to learn, how much is waiting for me, how destiny stares at me in the mirror. Somehow, finding the peace within has led me to the past lives I still have trouble believing, how meditation was in their journey, and how I just have to believe in the voices. I have no one to share or compare the, ha the heaviness I feel when I'm not enough for my mission how I feel I already failed as a Buddha or as a spiritual teacher because of fear, because I love the chaos so much, it's the only thing that has been consistent in my life. I was not taught the things I know, I became my own teacher, and I can't even teach myself right now. How can I teach others? I become envious of the people who are aware and more aware than me. I feel so stuck in the middle, phasing into and out of human and spirit. I don't feel as if I belong in either world. My vision is blurred and I'm forgetting to breathe. My core feels rocky, I feel unprepared. Everyone speaks of different ways to meditate. But what about the resentment you feel when you fight yourself to become better? How at the every fleeting thought, it's a test to see how far you've come with self-discipline. How do I calm myself when I know I'll grow higher? I'll become a version that many people will not understand. Is the loneliness I feel now different from the one in the future? I feel how huge the network of my brain is, how I, f I feel how my body isn't real. I know the gods and goddesses are watching me. This pressure I feel to be more equally pushing and keeping me in a place. Chest out, breathe in. Shoulders back, breathe out. Center yourself into lotus pose on your throne. Breathe in, breathe out. Sometimes I feel like I'll never help anyone, that I'm doing more damage by being alive. Breathe in. 
breathe out. People are dying unaware of the universe's cycled into karmic debt, unhappy with life, the process, unaware, the life, oh, the karmic debt, unhappy with life, the process, unaware of each breath in and every breath out. Thank you. Um, just before I announce the next reader, I just had one more thing that I forgot to say at the beginning, which is that there's an after-party poetry reading to this poetry reading. Um, tonight at 9 o'clock at the Mercado Annex, there's going to be another reading um, called Last Night, a Poet Saved My Life. Um, uh, Fareed Matuk, a former POG board member, is going to be reading, along with uh, Sasha Hawkins from Phoenix and Hannah Lawless from Tucson. And there will be a dance party afterwards, DJ by DJ Nada. Our next reader is Charles Alexander. Thank you. I made that comment earlier about going back 100 years. I guess I've been thinking about time, and so I decided to go back in some of my own writing. I can't go back 100 years, even though it might seem like that sometimes. Um, but this is... 12 years ago, and then a little piece that's far older than that, and both from notebooks, still in notebooks, so if I stumble because I have to read my own handwriting, forgive me. This is like a preface or something. To think through and around a thing, the part and the whole, the center and the periphery. To think through the self and around outside the self, about the world, the field, the picture, the poem, the mark. But not to think about the self, or not that exclusively, for that is the error of thinking the self is the center. And while it might seem it is our center, it is not. And it is certainly not the center. We are not one. We are one among others, and we are dispersed among the whole. To think as though there is no center, and to think as part of flow. Flow is what is, yet what is is never certain. We are with, we are in and of. There is something of deray in all of this, for to know a thing is to know it in time, and to know that all is in motion, all is motion in time, and time is a construct that simply marks the motion. Yet the thing, object, or perceivable, or emotion, seems within, while time, deray, seems a part of the whole, rather than a part of the part. Yet this is not quite right. Things are not entirely separable in that way. When we speak or write things that matter, that seem wise, it may sound trite, bits of intelligence that have been around, have been true in some sense for a long time. Yet if we don't speak them, we don't think them often enough. And what we do speak is primarily meaningless, though it has a social function, getting comfortable with others, gaining some sense of community with others, the root in talk among God's siblings or our word gossip. Yet most often it goes nowhere and our talk does not help us stay in touch with or our core beliefs and wisdom, even if we know what those beliefs are. And quite often we do not. On the nature of the self, the overbearing weight of it and its boundaries, we might do well to think about the skin and how we conceive this semi-permeable boundary. Is it a boundary, our limitation, our protection, even our face to the world, somewhat covered? Is it entirely our own? Or is it that membrane where I meets not I, that is a shared surface of contact, where I become other, where other becomes I? Do we walk, move with a sense of commonality with everything? Or do we walk, move as though we want to protect ourselves from everything? And do we allow the skin, the face, to show what and who we are without deception or emendation to the world and even to ourselves in the real mirror and in our interior mirror that we always see? Or do we present something through and on that skin face, something that may be part I and part fictive I. But then this begs the question, is there an I at all? 
Is there such a thing as a true self, or are we always in some way making one up? Not out of whole cloth, but out of what we desire, perhaps out of what we fear. A dream or part of a dream last night, 30 December, that someone had written a small entry, several lines, in this book in a reddish purple ink color. At first I thought it might have been Cynthia, then one of my daughters. I could not decipher in the dream what it said. Not upset, rather I was pleased that the writer read what I had written, though I was not certain of that, and had written to me, or possibly with me. Writing too is shared, it flows from one to various others. Even the most private writing, through the act of writing, leaves us, exists outside the individual. It becomes either actual or potential shared material. Communication is between and among. To parent is to be responsible for another, yet as that child grows to give up control, little by little, yet to keep a sense of responsibility. Children, though, and young people and young adults are not formable like clay, though I must try to see that my child becomes the best human being she can possibly be. A lot of what she becomes, probably the greater part of it, will not be because of anything I do or say. She is herself, her core beliefs. Again, I have some doubts about such things. The fixity the concept seems to represent will not be my core beliefs. Her ever-developing, ever-flowing heart and soul will be her own. Early morning, before light, the end of the coldest night in a long time. The house holds four of us, along with two cats and a dog. Now others begin to rise and join the day. I give thanks for what we have together. This little short one is just two pages in, in a smaller notebook, too. And I, I don't know what this is, really. But it's similar, though, in some ways. Being everyone and no one, the watch keeps ticking. Ask for gift of drama, food on a Thursday, ashes and other dust blowing purely biological distinctions in a lake bed brimming, is there or not, water, full of conversion and pleasure in conversation, looking out for what comes near, prose reaction to nonconformity, angels speaking, lost or adaptable, might be tested, am in the book, side and forward, page torn by hand, wet before that to specifications at once erotic and useful, otherwise to be ignored by readers and set in drawers. What is unreachable has no effect other than memory makes a wedge to take heads off. Nonsense may possibly not be. Margins clear for enunciate, to enunciate stellar presence, not there unto one another. Gutter ascending as central, free from color. I just want to say a word. Our next reader is Richard Kavanagh, known to many in this community as, as poet, as worker, as friend. And uh, he has uh, a book coming out at either the end of this year, beginning of next year, from Chax Press, which I'm very excited about. Richard. Thanks, Charles. Hello, everybody. Fish in new pond. Naked to the sky, their beauty now exposed in clear, clean water, orange and white, at rest or playing games amid the plants. The man who saw whose labor had built this new pond recalls an old fear when his beautiful daughters went into the world. <laughs> Poetry has its uses. I value its utility. Uh, a few weeks ago I was at a memorial service and at the end of the reception 
After many people had gone up to talk to Joe, I finally had my time to go up and talk to Joe. So what was I going to say to Joe about the death of his father? Well, I thought of a poem. Which one? Which one? I, okay, not my dad's poem because that was 1985. Um, my mother's. Uh, it has kind of a different title because uh, it's the death of the second parent. Uh, his mother was still alive, so this is the change I made. There is a loneliness singular to the death of the second parent. That's where I changed it, right there. There is a loneliness singular to the death of the father. That is not a singular far f singular sorrow. It is not felt in the yellowing and falling of leaves from deciduous trees with their hope of spring but rather in the felling of that tree, the burning of its wood in winter, and the mixing of its ashes in our soil that reminds our memory of the shade it made in our youth when we climbed its branches, <coughs> when in its arms our view was not diminished by distance or time when summer and sunlight were sufficient. We've had some beautiful sunsets lately. Color and clouds so quickly gone to gray. Ashes of a fire. Thank you. Next poet is Janice Dewey. Everyone, my name is Janice Dewey, and this is my only book of poems. It came out last year during COVID, so about three people have seen it. And uh, the first poem it comes from a section that's all numbered, and it's number two. Forgive me. In his hidden life, the banker dealt himself a card. Queen of spades, no good. He dealt another, three of diamonds. In this game, jacks are most valuable. So queens and threes might as well be trying to cross the border to a new life, all the while knowing they are garbage. Useless cards in the shuffling, looking for place, looking for worth. Flat, edges ragged, but adding up to something with the help of friends and other denominations. The queens and the threes line up, get processed and counted, are discarded once again. Coyote Dog. Coyote Dog didn't need to log on to beliefnet.com to pick stars or spirits of the day. It was Friday the play day, one for fools and poised dancers and a steep ledge of recognition to slide down, belly prime with prickly pear and rap. The other pack howlers were way off in Keening. Night wind, a telephone line straight to Coyote Dog sitting ledge watch on sacred haunches. The nose aloft and ears prickled. Giant sound receptors for desert wisdom. I hear you rustling, Colorado Toad. You can't hide those clicks or that plopping girth. Take this message back to Creek Rocks. One can't move along the sand without an exit strategy. One can't hide in the water without air. Tell the rocks to stay where they are until the pack arrives to lick their quartz faces. And I'd like to recite the title poem, How to Feed a Horse. It is different from feeding a growing boy like James, who could eat a horse. Still, I am enamored of horse eyelashes 
and mules and llamas longer even. There is no shirking their loving glances. I'm being roped in, lassoed by lashes to a feeding seduction, intimate sharing. So bring on the boxes of rinsed carrots and let me splat a striped watermelon on the ground, for I am satisfied by approximations to the big fabled mouths, cartoon teeth crunching, crunching. <laughs> Phillips. Boy, howdy, hollow jester. That sure is one shit ton of wild seed. Me, I'm a real slut for significance, or at least that's what they say, how I signify Gallop galloped in here all day, sidewinders and serif swindles. Woo-wee, let me tell you I could ante anything. Or maybe I already did. Guajalote totorote, why you can. Recite a little ditty, why yes, thank you, I can. Easier done than said, better off a deadhead, desert marigold, tell you what. It ain't a silver piece you can make tails or heads of where I came here from. Loads of quicksilver to the money strike. Call you a lucky cuss, a kissing cousin, a carousing cahoot shoot. If it ain't what I say, it's how I set it real gritty. Sediment, sediment, sentiment, sentiment, an alluvial look. I put all your glorious shit in my pipe and smoked it, so welcome. This ain't my first time here, but it's been a long time clear how I will hollow every halo I'm a dead ringer bet. Set go. I was born in Tombstone. I've become everything I ran from. Finally learned to talk the way they talk where I learned to walk all blooms and braggadocio and bullshit, obviously. Shouldn't I be ashamed for all to see? It's been decades loosely. Tourists trapped in glass bubble bolos slung in emporiums embalmed in sepia portraits. Born in tombstone, a white kid, snakeskin, dawn twin with sunset, sunset, sunset. I'm telling you, poems are what I wrote out of there on. All heat wave, mirage, sweat and song. The newspaper there called the epitaph and my birth announced in it already epitaphed, columned in caliche, rectangle dug, a regional hospital dig it. There they thought my heart had a hole, but it turns out I'm just a bleeding heart. Maybe I'll be dead before sunup, giddy sunup, sunup, somebody, get a tourniquet, tie my mouth shut with cursive, letter to the editor, on what I'm supposed to be. Fuck no, I don't think I'm special. Just out of the hell hole, another lucky cuss in hock to the good graces in lock key, my holy places. Born of asbestos and rust. Can't look at it too closely, might start to take myself seriously. And what then? Carve a dingy constellation into the dust, a new sign to be born under. So how about this? The spiked shoots of this plant, puncture from boulders, Still stained pink after all the bloodshed. Named this place Dragoons. Said never too soon to forget. But remember that the coral bean blooms red between the cracks, slender crimson feathers. When all else is death, there is where young mother sang to baby be, baby me, old songs under an Arizona oak tree. Thanks. Hello. So, um, quick announcement. I'm trying to start a Sabino poets group. People that would go meet in the lower canyon at a specific place once a month, maybe. Um, get inspired, share a little writing, do a little writing. So um, I need to get a note out to people about an initial meeting soon. But if that interests anybody, find me, get me your email and name, and I'll get something out to you. 
This is called Don't Look Back, about an incident in my childhood. It's in three parts. First one, amor. Grainy black and white TV screen on a rare night. Ten summers old and everyone asleep, a bed, a snooze, but me. Chance late night exposure to the story of Orpheus and Eurydice set in a favela, a shanty town, high above the city in 1950s Rio. Marpessa Dawn, the innocent young woman from the countryside, Eurydice. Breno Mello as Orfeo, the streetcar driver, samba dancer, and guitarist. Their story unfolds during Carnival. Samba, bossa nova soundtrack, drawing me in, never letting go. They fall in love, but are threatened by his enraged ex, Mira. Hey, he never really broke up with her. And a stalker, it might be death himself, who followed Eurydice, oh, my screen is flying around, who followed Eurydice from her hometown yeah, they both have serious baggage. Jobim brought Bossa Nova to this French film in my Jersey living room. Louis Bonfa's music pulsed through the story and into the eternal life of jazz standards. Part two, Morchi, death. Made in the 50s, revealed to me in the 60s, a fifth grader Weaving in and out of dream time, ancient tale, modern twist, death in the underworld spread before me, star-crossed love and grief in Portuguese with English subtitles. Orfeo cannot accept Eurydice's death and is brought to a condomle ritual. I looked it up. A wild-eyed cigar-smoking woman is touched by spirit a white-haired elder channels his lover's voice. But as in the Greek story, he's warned, don't look back. Turning and seeing this old crone, he's shocked into accepting Eurydice's death. Orfeo collects her beauty, her, sorry, her beautiful lifeless body at the morgue carries her high up into the hills where he lives, only to be pelted with a rock by Mira. The young lovers are struck, knocked off a cliff together, joined again in death where they land, wrapped in each other's arms. Vida. Meanwhile, the kids who had followed him around the neighborhood coveting his instrument Orfeo, can you really make the sunrise with your guitar? See the sun about to peak above the edge of sea and sky. One of the boys takes up Orfeo's sacred strings and starts to play. As the sun rises, the other little boy and girl dance. Soon all three are samba dancing. The cycle spins on. As credits roll, I'm trying to take all this in, this haunting of my heart, wondering what stories are behind the story I'm carrying alone into my dream world. With all the roosters, percussion, dancing feet, competing samba school costumes, and passionate emotions, Orpheus and Eurydice. Our next reader is David Siemens. here. It's so great to be in an in-person poetry reading again. It's been too long. Uh, so I have one poem here. 
And uh, I don't know if you've ever wondered what if Wallace Stevens were evil, but <laughs> that a question occurred to me. So this is titled Evil Wallace Stevens. <laughs> Life proceeds spectacular. Plums and guns and Dracula and drugs and love and macular degeneration. Sweet, so sweet, in the icebox there, dancing, enchanting, decanting in the air. Forever dead in Eurydice, no more. I am fleet. I can see the shore in manic motion. Wine in thrall to drink itself open into flesh love, beat blood, ripe crud in the gums of a sea god, self penury. Shore caught groping, shore. I am yellow, prayer inverted. Simple, empty harmony. I've seen one too many cockatiel and toucan splendor. We are what makes us bored and hoard the dragon's hoard of nectar in our baggy maws and dream. I am the praetor of scenes. Apropos, the wind within the sea, the green within the tea, the buzz within the bee, and their ability to please me. But it's a damned dream, a dream that's dreamed by dreams. Alas, we are what we receive, the streaming in the stream. Languid daughters of the beam make sorry things oracular, and tomb-like toys into buxom actors. Green wings flatter, ever flatter, absence accrued. Nor in annulment is the amulet, but rather a thousand Imhoteps, Penelopes, and Alexanders in parade. Nor in fire's gulping flame will Heraclitus save you. Change has changed change into a polyutropic goblin. Putrescent Uncle Gleam. The slaves of slaving screens are makers of the songs they sing, certainly, as the songs they sing invade desire. Impenetrable gloom. The queens are marching in platoons. The angels leap through evenings, violent, violet pleasure. Our next reader is Cynthia Miller. This is fun for me because I'm not a poet. So, um, I mean, not like you guys. But anyway, Al Rosh Hashanah is coming this weekend with the new moon in Libra. So get yourselves organized, people. It's coming. And, uh, I saw a, a very good friend of mine, a Jewish friend of mine, died this past uh, spring. Um, happiest woman I've ever met in my life, and the kindest woman I've ever met in my life. Anyway, what a bubby, right? So I wrote her this poem, so I'm going to share it with you. For Marsha Hirsch. Let there be zucchini bread, let there be brisket. Can I make you a coffee, strong like Sid likes? Can I make you a friend? Let there be cookies, all kinds and delicious, to go with our coffee, our white wine, our story. Can I paint you a teapot, red flowers, an elephant? Let there be music, sweet peas in the garden, spring flowers and hummingbirds, small dogs to love. Let there be beauty with a capital B. Let there be friendships, both strong and surprising. Let there be dear hearts to laugh with forever. That's for my friend Marcia. And then, um, because I've become sort of a, I took up Zen Buddhism during COVID because I was home a lot and sitting around anyway. <clears throat> so here we go. So, um, um, Robert Thurman, if you know about Robert Thurman, is a, is a Eastern religious scholar, Tibetan scholar mostly, but um, very important in that world. He taught at Columbia for years and years. Anyway, I think about him a lot because he's kind of, he's kind of make, he makes it accessible to understand some of the, um, uh, the hoopla around Buddhism. So here it is. I wish Bob Thurman would come over to dinner. 
Tell me what to do with my infinite life and my fennel. How's Uma, I'd say. We have an Irish whiskey and a Tibetan prayer over cow cheddar cheese on club crackers multigrain. And you, he'd ask me about my day and why I'm crying. I'm tired, I say, of saying goodbye, hello, goodbye, hello. <laughs> How it goes and goes like Peloton, the infinity bike of breath and legs without journey. Oh, oh. Maybe Bob would find a joke. Some Buddhist story we can both laugh at, really laugh, like the one about screwing up so much you have to come back many times as a four-legged short-lived mammal. How do we see the sunset from here, Bob? All the houses and city in the way. The earth tilts and we hang on, lose our minds a little to all the beauty. Tell me, Bob, are you tired? I can read Norman's poems to you. I can read Phil Whalen or Nanao. Put these crackers in your shirt for later. <laughs> okay, I have one. Do I have time? Yeah. Okay, I have one more. Um, you know, you drive around and there's always these people, desperate, desperate people standing on the corner with a little sign that looks like it's older than they are. And, you know, and they want your help. They want your money and they want your help. And you hope it's not a scam. And sometimes you give them, you know, what you don't have to give, but you give it to them anyway. Okay. So I had this thought about, you know, the, of course, the monks in the old days had nothing but a bowl, right? They made a little bowl. and. Uh, they hoped people would fill it with something. So I started to think about what would you fill it with, you know? And aren't we all kind of walking around with an empty bowl? Right? So that's the, that's the story of this. <sighs> Say, fill my bowl with kindness. Fill my bowl with patience. Fill my bowl with understanding. Fill my bowl with beauty. Fill my bowl with friendship, with sunlight, with moon. Fill my bowl with gratitude, animals, and flowers, with birdsong. Fill my bowl with poetry, earth, music, painting, and dancing. Fill my bowl with children. Fill my bowl with pine trees. Fill my bowl with orange blossoms. Fill my bowl with laughter. Fill my bowl with kindness. Annie Guthrie anywhere. Our next reader, uh, our next reader will be David Weiss. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm going to be reading from this uh, project I've been working on called Ebbles, and it's a uh, look at uh, art as close attention, I guess. High strung finger hum, the face poem trance, scratching eye from eye, the penny part drum sticking words in, new, never wholly new. Dusty leaves near pods some, steel outlier, free or else or. I saw the caterpillar fall, fell so slowly, so unfathomably slowly, hit the brick with a little pfft sound, was green and plump, surrounded by caterpillar shit. I picked it up, held it so it gripped the branch again. It wouldn't. The mid-tone wafts along alabaster boughs, its watery extent, its watery mind. The eagle loom peels this dotted head, diagonal line and flat hairs. Along the hollow edge, consecrated notion glue. Pacing and perturbed, pacing and privation. To fill, yet unbarred aftermarket scape. Windy water along gravity's falling arc. All breath and burning song. Buried under soil and sea. May not be, yet seems there. Pelicans dips low, speeding rippled tension. Reflected motion along mingled edge. Thanks. And our next reader is Will Stanier. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 
I have two poems and I printed them in perfect six point font. <laughs> <laughs> It's called Travel Poem. Watching from this tower of high rocks where I am, one can of fizzy beer, one egg boiled hard, one hawk and another blackbird, raven or crow, one found item of steel, bolt and threads, nut screwed into this tower of high rocks where I am. And the second poem is called Weird Languages, and um, I wrote it for some uh, really beloved friends who lived in the neighborhood, my partner, a nice house, and uh, they moved away, so I wrote this poem. Weird Languages. What I mean is always on the other side, other than the words I mean. Our breakfast cooking up smells to welcome us home here. This house, we cleaned, clean as a bone, gone some weeks, now returned. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, you said, as cover, because you cooked too much. Tomatoes, onions, soft boiled eggs, balsamic salad, and butter on toast. Good a time as any to change, get back, remain the same, and better. We could be house flippers. We could manage an antique marketplace, a curiosity shop for our curious things. I want an unabridged dictionary of everything, I said. I want a fat book of just words to read. Promiscuous stems apically rising from agave rosettes, we stroll by with our morning coffee. It's only language after all, the cat now crying, hawks in the eucalyptus tree, the largest in our neighborhood. Our friends across the street, did we ever really meet them? Of course we did. They gave us a mysterious microwave. Thank you. And the final reader tonight is John Melillo, who somehow magically connected to the Olive Melillo you heard earlier. John. I'll do uh, two things. The second piece is um, a translation of an essay by uh, this poet, Henri Chopin, who is a very well-known um, sound poet, French sound poet, who uh, wrote this in 2001, late in his life. It's called Réalité Sonore, Sonorous Reality. Reality. Vibrations of voices were given to me before and after birth, in liquids and then in solids. In the enormous noise that assails our senses via our shivering skin, slowly the breath cries become, in graphs and little by little, 
words in their signs. Drawn, blobbed, marked, cut off, spelled out, handwritten. All this together demanding the deep enfolding of letters under the cover of so-called natural languages, ordaining themselves the vehicles of the Latins, the Germans, or the Slavs, etc., the English. All this together forcing themselves on the magnificent accents born of our forms shaped by unlimited numbers and harmonies. We are powerful resonators and our breaths do not deserve to be detuned anymore. Undercover and under the lid of one identity alone, one unique nation, we prefer the voices cleavers. We prefer the choppers of voice. How often have I said poetry exists only by life in its voice, by what excludes national myths, refusing laws and measures, or the tables, or ceremonial phases, or even rituals and their drugs. So then, poetry is before all a fluctuation that does not recognize itself by the uniformity of measures when it has in its powers the life of mountains that, happily, are not fixed in their forms and in their breaths. Thanks.